Open your Bibles to Psalms 142. Writers speak about writer's block. I'm not sure what you would call it whenever it applies to preachers unless it's preacher's blank. Maybe that's not really a good way to phrase it. It might be uh, preacher's fog. Uh, you know, probably nobody but a preacher has any idea of what I'm really talking about. When I, when I started preaching, I thought, you know, it's going to be wonderful whenever I've been preaching several years and I've got all of these sermons that I've worked on, got them ready, and boy, and I'll know so much more about the Bible and I'll, Wow, I'll just be able to preach and, and, you know, not have to study so much and what have you, but, but something happens. And it's not for lack of information. It's not for lack of knowledge. It has more to do with the fact that, uh, there's too much. There's so much that it's what? Where do I go now? And this has been one of those weeks when I've had a terribly difficult time in deciding what to preach. And like I said, I don't expect you to understand, but preachers would. And whenever you realize just how important a sermon can be, you don't want to just preach anything. You want to be confident that, uh, that whatever you say is what God would have you to preach and and so I, I thought I was pretty well settled on a particular subject and spent several hours working on that. And, and, and then I, I hesitate to say because so many times we blame God for stuff He didn't do. Well, the Lord led me to, you know, there's just got to be some times whenever you have no idea how you arrived at a conclusion You've prayed about it and you've thought about it and you've tried to block out all of the stuff that's going on around you that might influence your decision. But some way or another through that gut-wrenching process, and that's why Charles Spurgeon used to say the most difficult part about preaching is deciding what to preach. And I, I can understand what he meant. And so I thought I was on the right track and I worked on a particular message for Oh, at least two or three hours, probably more than that. And, uh, and then I decided, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to take a different approach. And, uh, so this is the different approach. And the title of the message this morning is Triumphant in Trouble. And our text is found here in Psalms 142. I'll read it in just a little while. As different as we are, we all have one thing in common, trouble. Job 14.1 says, man that is born of a woman is a few days and full of trouble. And just as there are different magnitudes when it comes to the stars, some are brighter than the others, and, and when it comes to our troubles, uh, they are of different magnitudes. There are some that are so slight that you hardly even notice. They're a mere inconvenience, something that momentarily distracts you, something that, you know, it bothers you for a little while, but you know I'm going to get, I'm going to get beyond this and it'll all be over. And then there are those others that just absolutely knock you off of your feet. And these are things that we cannot escape. And so we must learn to endure those things. But we need to take it beyond that because a lot of times, a lot of times, you know, we endure and we come out bruised and bloody on the other side of the battle and yet we're worse off than when we went in. I don't think that's what God intends when he subjects us to difficulties. God has a purpose and a plan. And we need to be edified, built up through these trials that we go through. So it's not just about enduring your trials. It's about being edified as a result of them. And 
In case you haven't noticed, two people can go through exactly the same thing and one comes out better and one comes out worse. It's like the old saying, the same sun that melts the clay, you know, uh, hardens the, the, the mud or the, you know, the, the clay. And so it has to do with the individual and our attitude toward it. Well, I think maybe one of the best ways for us to learn this lesson as how to be triumphant in trouble is to look at someone that served as a good example. And uh, I think David did that. Here in Psalms 142, he says, I cried unto the Lord with my voice. With my voice unto the Lord did I make my supplication. I poured out my complaint before him. I showed before him my trouble. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. In the way wherein I walked, have they privately led a snare for me. I looked on my right hand and beheld, and there was no man that would know me. Refuge fail me. No man cared for my soul. I cried unto thee, O Lord. I said, Thou art my refuge and my portion in the land of the living. Attend unto my cry, for I am brought very low. Deliver me from my persecutors, for they are stronger than I. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. I want to thank Bea for the bulletin today, because as I went through the bulletin, it seemed like Everything in there nearly had to do with the subject we're dealing with this morning. And, uh, she didn't, she didn't come and ask, well, uh, what's the title of your message? What are you preaching about? So I can fix the bulletin to match it. It just, it just worked out that way, you know? Just might be God had something to do with that. Amen? I mean, He works on both ends of the spectrum, you see. And so we're talking this morning about how to be triumphant in trouble. The famous preacher in London many years ago, Joseph Parker, made a statement. He said, uh, if a preacher uh, would preach to brokenhearted people, he said, no preacher would ever lack a congregation if he preached to troubled hearts. Now, I don't know that that's 100% correct or not, but I do know that everybody has troubles, and everybody needs God's Word and God's help in their time of need. Now, we're thinking about David, of course, here in this case, and here was a man that was after God's own heart. He was a great man, a man that that God had anointed for a very special work to do while here upon this earth. And mark it down, if David was not exempt, neither should we expect to be exempt from these difficulties. And as we look at this uh, this message here, we learn several valuable lessons from it. The first thing our attention is focused on is his trouble. That's obvious. And here is a, a prayer. If you go back to the very beginning, you'll notice the prayer of David while he was in a cave. Now, that's evidently in reference to the trouble that he had with Saul. And, and Saul was trying to kill him. David is hiding in the cave here. I mean, everything at this point seems to be up in the air. Uh, Saul was the king, a man who stood head and shoulders above everybody else, a man who was the king of the nation, and, and now here he has dropped all of his business. Think about that. He has just totally ignored all of the other kingdom business, as it were, trying to take out little David. He wants to get rid of him. And David, not being one that would fight back against God's anointed, David is hiding, trying to avoid the whole situation, and Saul is after him. Now, he doesn't give us any of the details here, and and that really doesn't matter. It's just the fact that here is David in a time of trouble. And I want you to notice that his trouble was severe. As I said earlier, sometimes our trouble is of such a a magnitude that it's not all that great. It's something that, you know, that we can just walk right on through, something that presents no great difficulty. 
But this is something that is severe. And and notice how in verse 3 that he describes his trouble. He says here that he is overwhelmed. That word overwhelmed means to be wrapped about. It's talking about someone that is wrapped about, as it were, in smoke. I mean, they're smothered on every side. That's the idea. That there's nowhere I can turn. I can't go forward. I can't go back. I can't go right, left. I can't go in any direction to get out of this trouble. I'm in it, and there's no way out. And then in verse 6, notice he says that I was brought very low. Now keep in mind, this is David, the hero. This is David that, you know, that God had anointed. This is David that, you know, was the giant killer. And here he is saying that he was brought very low. Here is a man that could kill a giant, but at this point, although he could kill a giant, he really, at this point, couldn't keep himself up. And I don't care who you are, how strong you are, how many years you've been saved, how spiritual you think you are. There just might come a time when you'll find yourself in a pit of depression. You'll find yourself in a place in life to where it seems like that there's no way out. And it seems like there's no way that you're going to be able to get up and to go on and to move ahead. And at this moment, now look, this wasn't the norm But we all at times act out of character when the pressure is on. And the pressure is on. His life is in jeopardy. And he said, I was brought low. I am overwhelmed. Now, to complicate all of this, notice in verse 3, notice the word they. They. They had laid a snare. His enemies had laid a snare. And he calls them persecutors in verse number 6. In other words, his... His difficulties was brought on by others. They had laid a trap for him. You know, trouble of any kind is bad enough, but when it is intentionally caused by somebody else, that makes it all the more difficult. And I don't want to say anything to make you overly suspicious of other people. Believe me, that's not a good problem to have. And I can speak as an expert because I tend to be that way. I tend to just, you know, not trust anyone really uh, because I realize that we can all can fail. I realize that your best friend today might be your worst enemy tomorrow. I know those things can happen. But let me tell you, it hurts whenever it's someone that you care about. And if you read the story of David, look, it was not somebody that lived afar off. It was not a stranger. It, 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 it was even those that were close to him. His own friends had forsaken him. And they've laid a snare for him. They're working overtime trying to trip him up and bring him down. And notice in verse number 4, this problem's not only severe... And it's not only brought about by others. It's easy to deal with something whenever it, one of those things that it just happens. It happens to everybody, you know. But boy, it's a whole different ball game when it's somebody that you care about that creates the situation that you're in. And he said in verse number four, he says, no man cared for my soul. Oh boy, to be opposed by your enemies is one thing. To be forsaken by your friends is even worse. And maybe the most difficult of all of it is whenever you get that feeling that that nobody really cares. I can't tell you how much it helps when somebody does something to express the fact that they are truly concerned about your problem. Am I right? Uh, You see, a lot of times somebody, they don't need a lecture. They don't need a sermon. Uh, All they need is somebody that will put their hand, you know, on their shoulder, give them a hug, and say, "I, I can't understand what you're going through. I can't imagine how difficult this is. I don't know what to say. All I know to to say to you is that I love you, I'm praying for you, just to know that somebody cares. But at this moment, 
David says, nobody cared for my soul. No one cares. That makes it, that makes it doubly hard to recover from whatever problem that you're in. Because a lot of times, you know, if you have this feeling that other people really do care about you, that, that's a means of motivation. You know, they care enough and, uh, you know, to, to speak the truth to you. And knowing they care motivates you to keep on trying instead of giving up. So here's David hiding in a cave in fear for his life, overwhelmed by his grief, feeling that nobody, nobody cares. Well, how do you get out of a mess like that? What do you do? And I'm so glad that we can look at this story and it just doesn't all end there in the gloom of the cave. I'm glad it doesn't end in defeat. David not only tells us about his trouble, but we can see from the story how he was able to be triumphant over his troubles. And and notice what he didn't do, first of all. He, He didn't complain to others. You'll search in vain to find him complaining to others. He didn't burden other people with his problems. He didn't even actually rebuke the others that showed no concern for his situation. You know, sometimes when we're going through difficulties, the first thing we want to do is to point a finger to somebody else and say, you know, I wouldn't be in this situation were it not for them. It's all their fault. And by the way, By the way, they may be contributors to your misery. They may have played a big role in you being where you are. But I'm telling you, it's not going to help you to complain to them. If Look, if they don't care, all of your complaints to them about them is not going to change them. So David is not complaining to them, nor did David become bitter and rebellious. Some folks seem to think that it is a license to leave the church if God doesn't operate according to our agenda. In other words, if something goes wrong, grandma dies, for example, unexpectedly, and how dare God take grandma before time? Forget the fact that the old woman is 88 years old and walking on a walker and, you know, and... and, Forget the fact that she's lived a good, healthy life all of those years and God has blessed her. Forget the fact that she loved the Lord and looking forward to heaven. Just how dare God take grandma? Or how dare so-and-so didn't shake my hand? I ought to, if I could remember all the words, I'd sing that old song, Excuses, Excuses, you hear them every day. Uh, you, you've heard it, haven't you? Well, he didn't even shake my hand. And, and people get, get all upset over the, sometimes the slightest thing and, 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 and they'll rebel against God as a result of it. And sometimes it's not what others did to us. It might be all of a sudden that, that God, you know, either causes or allows something to happen that we don't really appreciate. Because after all, he didn't get our approval first, and now the doctor says I've got a heart murmur, or the doctor says I've got, you know, cancer, or whatever it is. And when that happens, so many people rebel against God, and they get bitter at life. David didn't do that. Nor did David just accept this and do nothing. Now remember, we're still talking about what David didn't do. David didn't complain to others. David didn't get bitter. David didn't rebel against God. But he didn't just accept it and do nothing. Although he did not retaliate against his enemies, remember there was the occasion where David could have killed Saul. He found Saul asleep. And in fact, his followers said, now's your chance. Take advantage of it. Kill him. Be rid of your problems. Just get rid of him. Your problem will be over. You'll be king. Well, David knew better than to run ahead of God and to touch the Lord's anointed, and he left it all in God's hands. So he didn't retaliate against his enemies. 
But he didn't just sit back and leave everything to fate. He took positive steps in order to solve this problem. Notice what he did, verse 1 and 2. He requested help from the Lord. This is a prayer. He's pouring out his heart to God and, uh, and asking God for help. You know, unless a person is willing to pray about their problem, they can't expect to ever conquer their problem. And a lot of people go year after year after year with the same problem. I mean, you know what I'm talking about. You know people like that. It might be that you have a problem like that. A a, a problem, maybe it's a character flaw or whatever it might be, but it's certainly inconsistent with what you ought to be as a Christian. And that problem has been hanging on for years. You know, we attribute it to things like, oh, my bad temper is because I'm Irish or, you know, whatever silly excuse that we can come up with. And we just let it go on and on and on without actually taking it to the Lord in prayer. It might be a bitter spirit against someone else. And they did something to offend you. And instead of you praying about it and asking God to change them and to change you and to work in the situation, you just go on year after year doing nothing. Let me tell you, you don't have any right to complain about anything you're not willing to pray about. This prayer is an expression of David's faith in God. He believed that God could do something about it. He believed that God could make a difference. Isn't isn't that a wonderful thought to think that God can make a difference in your life? Katie was singing about grace. Thank God for grace. Paul knew that grace can make a difference. God taught him that. God said, no, I'm not going to remove the thorn, but he said, my grace will be sufficient. And and David knows this, and this is an expression of his faith in God. But then notice in verse number 3 that he did something else. Not only did he request help from the Lord, but he reminded himself of the fact that God knew. When my spirit was overwhelmed within me, then thou knewest my path. Wow. Wow. You know, and no doubt he felt totally forgotten by others. He said, no man cares for my soul. Others have forgotten all about me. But he knew that God's eyes are always upon his children. And let me tell you, regardless of how dark the night, you are never out of God's sight. He is focused on you at all times. I love what... The psalmist said in Psalms 46 and verse 1, he's talking there about the Lord being his refuge and being his help. And the very next verse, he said he's an ever-present help in time of trouble. But you're never in your trouble alone. God is there with you. God sees you. And, And that ought to matter to us. Sometimes we think there's strength in numbers. You know, whenever you back whenever I was a boy, that's when all of this gang stuff was really starting, you know, and the greasers against everybody else. And yeah, well it's it it's I could tell some stories that I better skip. I, I better leave them alone. But it's a good feeling whenever you know that you're going out to do fisticuffs against somebody. You don't know whether somebody else is going to jump in or not. And so the thing of it is, you bring two or three of your buddies along with you, you know, to back you up. Well, I got news for you. Regardless of what you're going through, you've got someone there to back you up, help you out, that will never leave you nor forsake you in your time of need. When you're sitting down at M.D. Anderson there waiting for those cancer treatments and so forth, and you have no idea how you're going to get through another treatment. I mean, it is so painful. It is so difficult. And you wonder to yourself, how am I going to do this? I'm telling you, God is there, and God will help you through that difficulty. Whenever you receive that notice that your wife or your husband is divorcing you, and all of a sudden, your world is, is absolutely coming apart at the seams. 
and you have no idea what you're going to do. I'm telling you, if you, listen, if you are in fellowship with God, if you're a child of God in the will of God, you can depend upon the grace of God. He'll help you through every difficulty that you might ever face. Just this week, and I've mentioned it in prayer requests, there have been those that have lost loved ones. And it's a wonderful thing whenever we know that our loved one has died and they've gone to be with the Lord. We know that to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord and to die is gain. We know all of that stuff, but, well, we wonder. How am I going to, how am I going to keep living without them? I'm going to miss them so much. How, how am I going to keep going? I'll tell you how you can keep going. You can keep going because God is there with you in the midst of your trials. And David knew that. And that's why David is praying for God's help. But there's something else that David did here that I think is of great importance, and that's the fact that David retained his hope in God. Look at verse 7. Bring my soul out of prison, that I may praise thy name. The righteous shall compass me about, for thou shalt deal bountifully with me. The worst thing we can do when troubles come is to lose hope. Because when that happens, all of a sudden we are filled with despair and we begin to make foolish decisions. We do stupid things where when we're in, in that, that state of mind. And David retained his hope through all of this. Uh, he had no idea exactly how it was going to work out. He didn't know when, you know, after all, God didn't give him a timetable and say, all right, hang in there because, you know, in three months or six weeks or whatever, this is what's going to happen. He didn't know any of that. All he knew was that God was with him, and that gave him hope. He never gave up hope. I don't know if you ever stopped to think about it or not, but you realize there are a lot of bad things people can do to you, but they cannot take your hope away. You have to give that up. You have to surrender your hope. Regardless of how bad people treat you, regardless of how they abuse you, whatever it is that you're going through, nobody can take your hope away from you. That's why we can never blame others for our problems. Well, you know, if it wasn't for what they did, if they'd get with the program, if they would act right, if they'd love me more, if they'd do this and they'd do that, then I could be happy. Well, why can't you be happy anyway? Aren't you but a sinner saved by grace? Hasn't God been good to you? Isn't that reason to rejoice in the Lord always, as the Bible says? No, the problem is not with the other person. The problem is, is you have surrendered your hope. You've thrown in the towel. You've given up on it. I'm telling you, happiness is a choice that we make. It's not something thrust upon us. It's not something taken away from us. It's a choice we make based on who we are and what we have as a result of the person and work of Jesus Christ. Regardless of what you do to me, you're not going to take my hope away. Charles Spurgeon wrote, he said, The gloom of the cave is over the psalm, and yet, as if standing at the mouth of the cave itself, the prophet poet David sees a bright light a little beyond. A bright Light a little beyond. That's that glimmer of hope that he had, that he refused to give up. Now, there's something really important. Listen carefully to what I say. Notice as he is praying to the Lord, expressing his faith in God, expressing his hope of the Lord, he says in verse 7, in the first part of it, Bring my soul out of prison. Notice that I may praise thy name. That I may praise thy name. 
I don't think that meant that he wouldn't if God didn't. I don't think that's the point. I think David was going to praise the Lord regardless of the circumstances. I think the whole idea here is, Lord, bring me out in the presence of mine enemies. Let them see what a good and great God you are. Deliver me that I might praise thy name. There's so many times whenever we are overwhelmed with trouble in our life and we pray, we want God to bring us out, we want God to heal us, we want God to spare our life. My question is, why? What right do we have to ask God to heal us and to keep us alive and to solve our problems? What right do we have to do that? Well, he says that I might praise thy name. I'm telling you what, you can pray with confidence when you ask God to do something in your life that will enable you to praise Him all the yet more. Amen? Amen. And that brings us to David's testimony. I don't think I need to, I don't think I need to even hardly say anything about that. Here we are, more than 3,000 years later, talking about David. And we look back on his life and we think about the, the great things that God did through this man. And there's no telling how many hearts have been touched and how many lives have been transformed as a result of what people learned through the life of this one man. You could say, although a long time dead, he still speaks. He still has a message for us today. You see, our troubles give us an opportunity to show the world what God can do. Don't waste it. Don't waste it by blaming others and complaining and and feeling sorry for yourself. Every person here has more than they deserve. If we don't deserve anything, we have no right to complain about anything. And if we ever really get that through our thick head, if we ever really come to understand that, that we are so vile and so sinful that we deserve absolutely nothing from God whatsoever. And if we don't deserve anything, how dare we complain about anything? And so many times, you know, we reason to ourselves, all based on this nonsense of the self-esteem movement. You know, I deserve more and bigger and better. I am somebody and, and I deserve it. And as long as you feel that way, let me tell you, you're going to live your entire life in a state of disappointment. Because there's always going to be something that's going to yank the rug out from under your feet. Always going to be something that will darken your day, something that will cause you grief. Because God's not running this planet according to your agenda. He has His own plan. And it's perfect. And there are a lot of times, even though we don't understand it, a lot of times that God makes life worse so it can be better. And that makes the bad good. You know what Paul said? All things work together for good to those who are called to the Lord according to His purpose. Those you know, who love God. God takes the bad, those things that bring you great suffering, those things that make you miserable. And yet, if we maintain the right attitude, and it's our desire to glorify the Lord instead of gratify self, if that's our heartfelt desire, some way or another, God's going to turn all of that upside down, as it were. That's why the psalmist said, it is good for me to be afflicted. He said, before I was afflicted, I went astray, but now I've kept thy precepts. 
Do you ever think about your trouble being something that is good for you? I've often said in our dealings one with another that you can't help some people by helping them. What you do is enable them. You keep them dependent upon you. You don't help them by helping them. Because they're not going to get better till they get worse. Let me tell you, God is a whole lot smarter than we are. He knows how to deal with His children. And He knows sometimes the only way to make us better is to allow things to get worse. And He either allows it, allows it or He causes it. Whatever. Whichever. He's in control. And He never makes a mistake. You don't have to to be defeated in your troubles. There's no reason for any child of God not to live a victorious life. We are more than conquerors through Him who loved us and gave Himself for us. I could go on and on and on talking about how that God's people have every reason to believe that they can be victorious in their troubles. But if you're here today and you've never received Christ as your Savior, if God isn't your Father, if heaven isn't your home, if the Holy Spirit isn't your helper, if your sins have never been forgiven, you've never trusted Christ as your Savior. I, 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 don't, I don't have any word of assurance to give you in your trouble. All I can tell you is the truth, and the truth is it's going to get worse. Maybe not the problem you're going through, but certainly when you breathe your last breath. Because the Bible says, as an unbeliever, you are condemned already. But you don't have to leave here that way. That's the good news. Because the Lord is willing to save you. And when He saves you, He changes you and enables you. And you become a new creature in Christ Jesus. And everything these Christians have available to them, you can have exactly that. And I'll guarantee you if we took a vote right now, there's not one Christian in this building that would raise their hand and say, I regret the day I ever become a Christian. Not one of them. Every single one of them would tell you the most wonderful day of my life is the day I trusted Christ as my Savior. Would you do that this morning? While we stand together, as we lift up our voice in song and extend to you this invitation, and it might be that you've been saved, and and listen, you might be going through a difficulty in your life. David was in a cave. I don't know, you might feel like you're in a landslide somewhere. The whole world is caving in on you. You don't know where to turn. You don't know what to do. Do what David did. Just get on your knees and pour out your heart to God. And trust Him to bring you through it. Father, how we thank You for Your amazing grace. How we thank You for Your patience with us. And there's so many times that we murmur and complain about our difficulties thinking that we deserve better than what we have. Forgive us of our foolishness, Lord. And help us to so live that others might see Christ living in and through us. That it might create within them a desire to know Him as their Savior. May the Holy Spirit work upon our hearts and change our lives here this morning. For we beg it in Jesus' dear name. And now as we stand and 